Hello, it's Mark from Casting Through Ancient Greece here. Before we begin today's episode, I just want to recommend another excellent podcast. But I'll hand it over to Trevor from History of Persia to tell you more. I plan to dominate the Hellespont with a bridge and march an army through Europe against Hellas so that I may take vengeance on the Athenians for everything they have done to the Persians. Excerpts from Xerxes' speech to the Persian nobles. Hello everyone, I'm Trevor Cully, host of the History of Persia. The giant empire, casting its shadow over classical Greece, was the largest the world had ever known, home to nearly 40% of the world population. The history of Persia weaves through the stories of Greece, Egypt, Babylon, and even the Bible. And it didn't end with the conquests of Alexander the Great. Persian influences remained at the core of the Hellenistic world until Iran was finally conquered by the Arabs in the 7th century CE. If the stories of ancient Persia interest you, come check out the History of Persia podcast. You can find me online at historyofpersiapodcast.com or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. The fights between the Greeks and the Persians in the Straits of Euboea were not important as to make any final decision of the war. Yet the experience which the Greeks obtained in them was of great advantage. For thus, by actual trial and real danger, they found out that neither numbers of ships, nor riches and ornaments, nor boasting shout, nor barbarous songs of victory were any way terrible to men that knew how to fight, and were resolved to come hand to hand with their enemies. These things they were to despise, and to come up close and grapple with their foes. This Pindar appears to have seen, and says justly enough of the fight at Artemisium, that there, the sons of Athens, set the stone that freedom stands on yet. Plutarch, from the life of Themistocles. Hello, I'm Mark Selleck, and welcome back to Casting Through Ancient Greece, episode 22, The Battle of Artemisium. We are back from our short break in the narrative story of ancient Greece, and the Greek and Persian wars. I hope everyone enjoyed the look at the film 300 against the Greek sources. It was a pleasure to put together and see the positive response it received. I have already been asked if the next movie, 300 Rise of an Empire, would also be looked at, which I'm also going to consider doing. If you would like to see this happen, let your voices be heard on Facebook, Twitter, or leave a comment on the website. If I go ahead and tackle this one, it will be predominantly covering the events of what we are about to look at in the next three episodes. So let me know what you think and what you want to see brought up. But let's now get back to our story. In our episode on the Battle of Thermopylae, we saw the Greek efforts to defend central Greece on land at the Pass of Thermopylae. The pass was tactically an advantage from the Greek perspective, as the Persians would not be able to deploy an entire army against the Greeks in such a confined area. The Persians would be advancing on tightly packed formations of bronze-clad men, behind a shield wall, bristling with spear points. The Persians were much more lightly armoured, with just wicker shields if they carried one at all. Also, their spears were shorter than the Greeks, and would have had to get well inside the kill zone to make use of their weapons. Though after three days of fighting, the Greeks were undone by treachery, a path in the mountains revealed to Xerxes by Ephialtes, a local of the area. The Greeks would be cut off and surrounded where they would conduct their last stand. King Leonidas, aware of what was happening, was able to send away many of the Greeks, with just himself and his Spartans, along with the Thebans and Thespians remaining. In the last stand, the Spartans and Thespians were wiped out, while the Thebans surrendered themselves, or so we are told. King Leonidas's body was located and Xerxes had his head cut off and placed on a pike for all to see. We now head back roughly a week in time from where we finished with the Battle of Thermopylae, to now deal with the naval engagement at Artemisium. The events in action at Artemisium would be playing out at the same time events at Thermopylae were unfolding, according to our ancient sources. Although they were taking place some 40 miles apart, the outcome of both greatly affected one another. The naval force at Artemisium was protecting the land force from an outflanking move by the Persian navy, while the Greeks at Thermopylae were blocking the path into central Greece, with the hope that they would hold the Persian forces long enough for the festivals taking place at Sparta and Olympia to conclude. Once finished, the various city-states could move effectively to mobilise their citizens 
allowing the Greek land forces to assemble and march out with a full-size army to challenge Xerxes. If either the Greek naval force or the land force was defeated, the other's position would become untenable, forcing them to fall back, allowing the Persians to march further into Greek lands. I just want to point out here that I'll be referring to Xerxes' fleet as the Persian fleet, or Persians, collectively. But as I pointed out a couple of episodes ago, the fleet was made up of many different contingents within the Persian Empire, who were known for their seamanship. The Phoenicians, Egyptians and Ionians probably making up some of the most capable contingents. The Persians themselves would have made up only a small part of the fleet, if any at all. They were not known for their abilities at sea, although the main commanders leading the fleet were Persian. So when I call the fleet Persian, just keep this in mind, and what I am really saying is a fleet fighting on behalf of the Persian Empire. We last left the Greeks and the Persians taking up positions and harbours that they would hope to make use of strategically and tactically for the coming engagement. The Greeks initially positioned themselves just inside the opening of the Straits, would force the Persian navy to enter into the Strait to challenge them. The Persians were interested in destroying the Greek fleet, which was presented before them. Even if they wanted to bypass the Greeks by sailing around Euboea, this would have been a risky move as the Greeks were in range to launch an attack on a force that would not have been formed for battle, but in a strung out line as they sailed south. By drawing the Persians into Artemisium, a couple of the Persian navy's clear advantages had been somewhat reduced. From all accounts we hear about, the Persian fleet far outnumbered the Greeks, but in a restricted area like the Straits, it would almost be impossible to bring to bear their full force at once during the battle though their numbers still favoured them if a battle of attrition were to develop. What the Straits also did was restrict the area that the triremes could manoeuvre in. It has been recorded that the triremes in the Persian fleet were notably lighter and more manoeuvrable than that of the Greeks' heavier ships. With this restricted space, the Persian ships would not be able to take full advantage of the speed of their lighter ships. The historian Paul Ray makes an interesting observation that would on a tactical level benefit the Greeks even more. Had they made their base at the city of Histiaea, Further in the Straits, more advantageous options would have been open to them. The Greeks would have been much closer to Thermopylae, making communications easier. Supplying the fleet would have been much more straightforward due to the more accessible resources. And the Straits were much narrower at this point, further diminishing the Persian superiority in numbers. Though, he further points out that it seems that the commanders had their eyes on the bigger picture. As this would have left Artemisium unguarded, and being the first suitable point reached to disembark forces onto Euboea. If this was left to happen, the island would have fallen and Histiaea taken, which would have seen the Greek defence plan fall apart. This perhaps showed that a higher level of strategic and tactical thought was present in the Greek and Persian wars than is often given credit to. Herodotus' lack of strategic insight or his disinterest in it seems to have given birth to this thinking. This is just one occasion of many when the sources are read carefully, strategic reasoning seems to be on display. Though, before the battle in the Straits developed, first blood of the campaign had already taken place, before the Persians had entered and established their camp across from the Greek position. Let's take a look at the events taking place as the Persian fleet was still moving into their position. Before the Persians had made their way down to Artemisium to face off against the Greeks, they had met back up with the Persian army after breaking away from them to sail through Xerxes' canal and around the Chalcidides. They met at a place called Thermae off the coast of Macedon, where the fleet was also met by another 120 ships provided by Thrace and other islands in the area. Xerxes and the Persian army would soon depart Thermae to start marching south into Greece towards Thermopylae. Before the fleet was to depart, 10 of the fastest ships were ordered to sail ahead to scout out the advance for the main fleet. Outside the Straits of Artemisium, the Greeks had posted three ships from Troezen, Aegina and Athens to act as lookouts off the coast of Scathos. These lookouts and scout ships would be the first engagement of the campaign. The ten ships from the Persian navy were most likely Phoenician vessels and were able to catch the Greek lookouts by surprise. The Greek ships at once attempted to flee, with a ship from Troezen being caught and boarded almost straight away. Herodotus then tells us that the most handsome man aboard was taken and sacrificed, thinking that this would benefit the Persian cause. The ship from Aegina was also eventually chased down and boarded, but a fight for the trireme ensured where a man by the name of Pythias distinguished himself, continuing to fight even though he had suffered severe wounds. He eventually collapsed, but still alive, the Persians, instead of killing him, attempted to save his life. Later, when taking the prisoners of the ship ashore, 
but Theus was treated with great admiration, while the rest of the Greek captives were treated as slaves. The third lookout, the Athenian trireme, was able to make land before the ship was captured. All the Athenian crew were able to escape and make their way through Thessaly before returning to Athens. In response to these actions, a fire beacon was lit to signal to the main Greek fleet at Artemisium. What the signal was meant to mean, we are unsure of, but the Greeks seem to have interpreted it as a signal that the Persians were making their way to sail down the eastern coast of Euboea. The Greeks, thinking this would have compromised their position, left lookouts in the hills of Euboea, while the rest of the fleet headed south down the Straits of Euboea to Chalcis. If the Persians were indeed sailing in this direction, the Greeks would be able to challenge them at the southern end of the strait. Though it appears either the Athenians had misinterpreted the signal, or the men manning the fire signal on Scythos panicked after being stranded due to the capture of the Greek vessels. The rest of the Persian fleet had set sail from Thermae, 12 days after the army had departed their location. Now that the path was cleared, the Persians made their way south down the coast of Thessaly, until coming to a beach at Sepius, on the Magnesian Peninsula. At Sepius, the beach was only large enough to accommodate some of the triremes, with the rest of the fleet at anchor just off the shore. The next day it would seem that the Greeks' prayers had been answered, as at the start of the campaign, the Delphians had received advice from their own oracle, which they had reported to all Greek states defending Hellas. The oracle had told them, Pray to the winds, for they will be good allies to Greece. As the Persians began the day after their first night at Sepius, the calm weather they had experienced had turned. A violent storm had whipped up, some of the crews were able to see what was happening and managed to beach their ships along the coast. But many were caught off the coast, with the number being smashed up against the hills on the coastline. Herodotus says that at least 400 ships were lost in the storm, which would rage for three days. Many men were lost, as well as a great deal of treasure, as many merchant vessels had fallen victim to the storm. A number of locals in the area may have become wealthy after this cargo had washed ashore. The Greeks that had been left in the hills of Euboea had witnessed the storm and what befell the Persians out at sea. During the storm, messengers were sent to the Greek fleet at Chalcis to inform them of the Persian losses and also presumably that the fleet was not making their way along the eastern coast of Euboea. With this news, the Greeks made ready their fleet to sail back to Artemisium as soon as possible. The Persians now repaired and reorganised what they could before getting their surviving ships back into the water. With the passing of the storm, the fleet now continued south down the coast to their destination at Aphite, opposite the Greek position at Artemisium. As legend would have it, Aphite would be where Jason and the Argonauts would depart from on their quest for the Golden Fleece. Trailing behind the main Persian fleet were 15 ships that had probably either had trouble being repaired or had helped organise the rest of the fleet before setting out themselves. As these 15 ships entered the straits, they made their way towards a large body of ships formed on the beach ahead, though the ships that they had sighted were those of the Greeks, and before they realised their error, the Greeks were able to intercept them. The Greeks then gathered what information they could from the prisoners before sending them off to Corinth. The Greeks had also been assembling at Artemisium as the Persians were coming into the straits. Herodotus' account of events can make it a little confusing of who arrived in their positions first, and what actions were happening at what point during this period. From this ambiguity, it seems likely that the Greeks may well have had a small force still on the beach at Artemisium when the rest of the fleet sailed south. Then both sides had a steady flow of ships entering the straits throughout the day. As more and more of the Persians assembled across from the Greek position, the Greeks were now able to appreciate the full force of the Persian navy. Panic now started to set in at the Greek camp as they thought that the storm would have inflicted much heavier losses on the Persians, thinning them out. Like at Tempe, and would happen at Thermopylae, Retreat from the position was put forward. With this proposal now being discussed by many of the contingents, the Euboeans started to become very nervous, as their island would be the first to be consumed. The Euboeans had pleaded with the Greek commanders, Eurybiades, but to no avail. They then approached Themistocles, whose reputation preceded him. He was not shy in advancing his goals through more deceptive means. Or as the historian Barry Strauss puts it, he knew that a straight line is not always the shortest distance between two points. They offered him a bribe of 30 talents to help persuade the rest of the Greek force to stay put. One talent was equivalent to a year's pay for a skilled worker during these times. Themistocles accepting the bribe, or gift as he probably would have seen it, then in turn offered Eurybiades a bribe to keep the forces at Artemisium, though he only offered him a small fraction of what he was given himself by the Euboeans. Eurybiades 
took on the bribe and was able to convince all but one of the contingent commanders to stay. Themistocles then approached his commander and eased his apprehension with three talents. The Greek fleet would now stay at Artemisium. Themistocles walked away with a sizable profit, while Eurybiades and the other commander, unaware of Themistocles' dealings with the Eubians, walked away with what they thought was a gift from Athens. As these diplomatic manoeuvrings were carrying on in the Greek camp, the Persians continued to arrive in the straits, adding to their already formidable armada. By late afternoon, most of the fleet had arrived, and the contingent commanders could see that they outnumbered the Greeks greatly. The feeling amongst them was to attack the Greeks at once, since they were surely no match for their numbers. The commanders of the fleet, though, decided that it was too late in the day to launch an attack for it to be decisive, and they could risk losing the Greeks if they decided to slip away during the night. The Persian commanders decided on a plan to ensure that the Greeks would be trapped in the straits for when they did decide to attack. They detached 200 ships from the main fleet and sent them out of the straits and around the island before heading south down the east coast of Euboea, out of sight of the Greeks. The plan was for this detachment, once rounding the Euboean southern coast, to head back up the straits on the western coastline. Once the signal was given by the detachment that they were in place, the main Persian fleet would attack, trapping the Greeks with nowhere to escape. The Persians had no intention of attacking before receiving a signal from the detachment, and the commanders held a review of their fleet still at Aphite. Sometime during this period of inactivity, a deserter from the Persian side arrived in the Greek camp. The deserter was from the town of Scone in the region of the Chalcidides, north of Greece. He had been drafted into the Xerxes Armada as the fleet had been at Thermae weeks earlier. Herodotus tells us that he had been looking for an opportunity to desert some time, and had now found it. He was known as an expert diver and was supposed to have swam some 10 miles underwater from the Persian position to the Greeks, though Herodotus gives his opinion that he most likely made the journey by boat. On his arrival, he informed the Greeks how the Persian fleet had suffered during the storm and also advised them on the detachment sent to trap them in the straits. The Greek commanders, after learning of the Persian plans, had now formulated their own plan, which would see them turn and engage the detachment the following day, but they would stay put for now. As the next day arrived, there was no sight of the Persian detachment, so the Greeks now decided on a different course of action. Perhaps the discussions had also continued, as it seems like it would have been a bad idea to turn one's back on the main fleet while waiting a potential threat to the rear. The Greeks decided to test the Persians' tactics. To do this, it would be essential not to get into a long drawn out engagement, which would favour the superior numbers of the Persian fleet. The Greeks had assembled and set out from their shore in the late afternoon with the safety of the night not far away. Once darkness arrived, it would be almost impossible to launch a coordinated attack. It would be every ship for themselves. Even then, it would be impossible for the crews to distinguish friend from foe, and they would be sailing blind. As darkness approached, the crews would be trying to make their way back to land. The Persians would have been astonished to have seen such a small force sail out to contest them at this point. The temptation was too great. The Persian fleet readied and set out to meet the Greeks, seeing an opportunity to wipe out the Greek fleet and move on to support Xerxes. The Greeks had made their way out into the straits, and once seeing the Persians react, a signal was given to form up in a circle, with their bows, the fronts of their triremes facing outwards, and their sterns pointing into the centre of the circle, their bronze rams acting much like spear points out in front of a hot white phalanx. The Persians sailed out enthusiastically, confident of victory over this small force, as well as there being a reward and offer for the first crew to capture an Athenian vessel, considered to be the best ships of the Greek fleet. The size of the Persian fleet had no trouble in encircling the Greeks, their ships continuing to sail around the Greeks, cutting off any chance of retreat. The Greeks now had the Persians in a position that gave them the tactical advantage. As they circled around the Greeks in the centre, they were exposing the weakest part of the triremes, their sides. On a second signal, the Greeks shot out of their circle formation as quickly as the rowers could propel them, attempting to line up the side of a Persian vessel. Much confusion was brought upon the Persian fleet, and with night fast approaching, there was no hope reforming to now counterattack the scattered Greeks. Both sides sought the safety of their friendly shores, the Greeks having captured 30 Persian vessels in the short melee that had taken place. The action that had taken place had helped boost the Greeks' morale. Not only had they captured a number of enemy vessels, they'd also shown that clever tactics could win over sheer numbers. As night settled in, those divine winds that the Persians had prayed for earlier were once again at work. A large rain and thunderstorm had brewed up 
washing up wreckage and bodies onto the Persian shoreline, perhaps conjuring up ill omens for the crews there. Though the crews who were to suffer the most were from the detachment of 200 ships sent out to round the Euboean coast. They had still been at sea when the storm whipped up, effectively wiping out the entire Persian flanking force, dashing much of the fleet up on the rocky coastline. As day broke on the second day, the Persian force would have been cleaning up from the storm the previous night. They had no plans of launching their attack just yet, as they were still awaiting the signal from the detachment. Though as the morning progressed, they would have learned of the disaster of the hollows, as it was to be known, and the death of their battle plan. A new course of action would now be needed, and time for it to be implemented, which would see the Persians stay idle for the second day. For the Greeks on the opposite shore, the entire morning saw the Greek morale being boosted once again. They were on somewhat of a high after their success in yesterday's skirmish, but now an additional 53 ships arrived at Artemisium to join their ranks. Further to this, word had reached them during the morning of the destruction of the Persian force attempting to block their path of retreat. Surely a huge weight lifted from the minds of Eurybiades and Themistocles, with the removal of this uncertain threat in their rear. The Greeks had now planned for another evening skirmish, or raid like the previous day, but this time only a fraction of the force would take part. They would have been observing the activity taking place at the Persian side, with the ships coming and going from the straits, as well as patrols operating within the straits. It was probably one of these patrols that would be made up by a number of triremes that the Greeks decided to target. So as the afternoon came on, the Greeks readied their contingent to undertake today's action. They identified the target, a group of vessels who happened to be from the region of Anatolia, just north of the island of Cyprus, known as Cilicia. They made short work of the patrolling force, who were probably surprised by the action of the Greeks. After the Greeks had completed their mission, they headed straight back to their shore, not wanting to be the target of any Persian counterattack. With the end of the day near, the Persians would have just been able to look on, as there would have been not enough daylight left to arrange a force large enough to force any sort of decisive result. As darkness fell on the second day, the Greeks were in high spirits after the news and reinforcements they had received, along with another victory over the Persians. Supposedly this was also the second day of action over at the Pass of Thermopylae. But unlike the Greeks at Artemisium, there was still a detachment moving to outflank the position at Thermopylae. With the coming of the third day, the Persian commanders would have been under some pressure. They had not undertaken any offensive action against the Greeks, but had lost hundreds of ships through storms and skirmishes with the Greeks. They had entered the campaign with a plan to trap the Greeks before attacking, but the gods had seen fit to destroy their detaching force. Xerxes would have been getting news of what was taking place at Artemisium, while overseeing operations at Thermopylae, and would have surely not been pleased at the progress. The commanders had now had a whole day to come up with a new plan of attack, and this third day would see the Persians now take the offensive. The Persian camp would have been a hive of activity all morning as the crews prepared their vessels to engage in a full-scale battle. Around midday, the Persian fleet set out from Aphite, making their way for the Greek position. Their aim was to destroy the Greek defenders so as to open up the straits and not have to worry about a hostile force as they continued into Greece. The Greeks were looking at stalling the Persian advance for as long as possible, which was also aiding the Greeks at Thermopylae who also had a very similar objective at the pass. As the fleet rode towards the Greeks, the ships started moving into a crescent formation in an attempt to surround the Greek position. The Greeks had held their positions at Artemisium as the Persian fleet advanced, but once they took up this formation, the Greeks now rode out to engage with them. Today, the engagement would be more than just a skirmish, with both fleets fully engaged and would continue the battle all afternoon. Herodotus says that both fleets were evenly matched not in numbers, as the Persians were far larger, but they were unable to bring to bear their full numbers to engage at once. Also, the large Persian fleet was operating in a confined strait and found its numbers were inhibiting its effectiveness with many ships fouling one another as they attempted to close with the smaller Greek fleet. Both sides fought with a strong determination, the Greeks to defend the path into Greece, the Persians not to bear the shame of being defeated by a smaller force. The battle had raged on for hours, but now the sun was making its descent towards the horizon. Both fleets were beginning to disentangle themselves from the carnage in the straits and make for their camps. The Greeks had suffered heavy losses in men and ships, with the Athenians having suffered the worse, with half of their ships remaining being damaged. Though they were also the contingent amongst the Greeks who had distinguished themselves. In particular, the son of Alcibiades, Clinius, who maintained his ship 
and the 200 crew at his own expense. Amongst the Persian fleet, the Egyptian contingent had proven itself above all, having captured five Greek ships and all their crews. Though the Persians had also suffered a beating, suffering even more losses than what the Greeks had. Even though the Greeks had gotten the better of the Persians on the first two days, and then inflicted greater losses on the Persians than they had taken themselves on the third, they now understood that their current situation was untenable. They could not afford to take the losses that they were. If this battle of attrition continued, the Persians would eventually open up the straits, and the Greek fleet would cease to exist. As darkness was starting to fall over the straits, the Greeks were busy repairing and salvaging what they could, while other ships were out collecting their dead to be cremated. On the shore, observing the activity, stood Themistocles, who had just called for a meeting with the other Greek officers. He knew withdrawal south was their only option, but the Persians would continue after them, but they were still operationally effective and outnumbered them. As these officers assembled around, Themistocles informed them of the intention that they would be withdrawing from their current position. He ordered that the men should light campfires as usual, and added that since Eubea was essentially being surrendered to the enemy, that the men should slaughter and put on a feast, with as many as the sheep and goats from the nearby herds, so that they would not be left to feed the enemy. Lastly, he revealed that he had a plan to attempt to thin out the Persians some more, so next time they would engage, they would be on more equal terms. For now though, he gave no more details, and left his officers to arrange their contingents and crews for the withdrawal. As preparation was underway, a lookout on the left of the Greeks' position could see a vessel heading towards the Euboean coastline, from the direction of the Greek mainland. As the vessel got closer, the lookout saw that it wasn't a warship, but the 30 odd galley of Abronicus, who had been stationed near Thermopylae as a messenger. Abronicus was escorted to the Greek camp, where he delivered his news that sank the hearts of the Greek commanders. The pass at Thermopylae had fallen. While the Greeks were engaged at Artemisium, so too were the Greeks at Thermopylae. Though, at the pass, no divine intervention had destroyed the flanking force there. King Leonidas had fallen with all the troops he commanded. The land route for the Persians was now open, which made the Greek position at Artemisium irrelevant. Also, from Athens' point of view, they needed to make it back to make sure that the city would be evacuated before the Persians arrived. The preparations for withdrawal now proceeded with more urgency, and the first ships started leaving Artemisium, not long after the news of Thermopylae was revealed to them. During the night, the last of the Athenian ships, who brought up the rear of the fleet, left the Greek camp. Once Artemisium was clear of the Greeks, a local of a nearby village sailed across the straits and delivered the news of the Greeks' departure to the Persians. The Persian commanders were suspicious of this messenger's news, as the fires of the Greek camp could still be seen across the straits. Eventually, a scouting party and some fast ships returned to confirm what the messenger had told them. The Greeks had managed to slip away in the night, something the Persians had been mindful of since arriving at Aphite. They had taken steps to ensure the Greeks would be trapped in the straits, firstly by a strategic manoeuvre that was followed by bad weather, or the fickle gods. They were then left with tactical dispositions such as their encircling and crescent-shaped formations, but the Greeks had foiled these with their tactical skill, as well as brute force and determination. As the sun rose the next day, the Persian fleet crossed over the body of water that had been the battlefield of the last three days, and stopped in at Artemisium. Along the coast at various locations, a message had been carved into the rocks that many of the Persian crews would have come across. During the night withdrawal, Themistocles began acting on his plan to try and reduce the effectiveness of the Persian fleet. His idea was to either have the Ionian and Carian contingents desert Persians, or sow the seeds of suspicion with the Persian commanders and Xerxes, so that they would distrust these contingents. Both would have been considered some of the best contingents of the Persian fleet, as most of their cities were coastal, so sailing would have been part of everyday life. Nullifying them would surely take some of the sting out of the Armada. As the rest of the Greek fleet was sailing south, Themistocles sailed close to the coast in a fast ship, where he called out to the Ionians and Carians. He had also arranged that the same message be cut into the rocks for the crews to find. I will leave you with what Herodotus reports Themistocles of saying. Men of Ionia, it is wrong that you should make war upon your fathers and help bring Greeks to subjugation. The best thing you can do is join our side. If this is impossible, you might at least remain neutral and ask the Carians to do the same. If you are unable to do either, but are held by a compulsion so strong that it puts desertion out of the question, 
there is still another course open to you. In the next battle, remember that you and we are of the same blood, that our quarrel with Persia arose originally on your account, and fight badly. Thank you for your continued support. If you are enjoying the series, please consider leaving a review at iTunes as they go a long way into helping support the show. To receive updates and to be notified of new episodes, you can subscribe at castingthroughancientgreece.com. Also, you can follow the series on Facebook and Instagram at Casting Through Ancient Greece or on Twitter at Casting Greece. I hope you can join me next time for episode 23, The Fall of Athens.